good afternoon and good evening to all of you my name is amar and i'm part of the gender and livelihood scheme at intellicap i hope all of you can hear me welcome to sankal and welcome to this session um in this session we seek to foreground uh, the impact that care businesses have on the lives of women and girls and explore how this impact can be appropriately captured showcased of course and enhanced we have about an hour for this session and we have planned some time for questions so please type your questions in the chat box and hopefully we shall be able to take them up coming to the topic at hand um the pandemic has brought renewed focus to the burden of care work that is shouldered disproportionately by women globally women and girls perform 3/4 of the unpaid care work in homes and in communities every day the latest research indicates that the pandemic and the responses responses to it by way of shutdowns have resulted in a dramatic increase in this burden furthermore it also has a negative impact on the participation of women in the labor force it is likely that such negative impacts on women and families will last for years without any proactive interventions we have heard about the headwinds to meeting the sdgs in the morning today be they the pandemic the war or the climate crisis and everything associated with it it is in such times that transformational change becomes especially important and and especially for especially for the efforts towards achieving sdg 5 when so much progress towards that goal has been undone in the wake of the pandemic and the path forward seems a bit threatened the care economy is one such sector where there is potential for transformation conversations about the economic value of care work are not new it has been long recognized that metrics like the gdp ignore the care economy alternative systems that could value care work and facilitate a fairer share of domestic labor have been suggested it was back in the 1970s that an international campaign demanded that governments recognize the value of care work it is quite evident that while such structural changes will occur at their own pace the private sector is being increasingly seen as an actor that can have an impact and it is further to this background that the idrc and osf are supporting a consortium led by core global and of which intellicap is a part to establish a care economy knowledge hub the broad intention of this exercise is to explore the role that the private sector can play in recognizing reducing redistributing and rewarding care work to understand the role that impact capital can play and ultimately to foreground this sector as a potential opportunity for impact investors thus far the effort has created a mapping of more than 150 businesses in the care economy across research countries in southeast asia africa and latin america the research team is now in the process of creating profiles of these businesses and shall eventually create detailed case studies of a subset of 20 all of this knowledge will be available in the public domain uh, on the website of the care economy knowledge hub and i'll request one of my colleagues to paste the link to the hub in in the chat as we were mapping these these businesses uh, we kind of realized that the businesses are essentially solving a market problem and filling in a market gap and may or may not be aware of the extent of impact uh, they have on women's care burden and this impact this impact is very real though and supporting such businesses can go a long way in in enhancing such impact and as as i mentioned earlier this session really seeks to foreground this impact and explore how it can be captured and enhanced and we have a very relevant panel here today with panelists having direct experience working in for or researching the care sector i'll quickly introduce them in in no particular order we have andrea azevedo team manager for impact and partnerships at the open society foundations we have amy gloria interim ceo at the fair fair employment foundation and we have subalakshmi nandi senior program officer at at the bmgf thank you to all of you for for making the time to join us today to start us off i'll request andrea to share her thoughts about osf's approach to the care economy and the importance of of businesses in the care economy uh sure thank you very much for this introdu introduction amar and 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 thank you for my uh fellow panelists today and everybody who's attending the call for your interest on this team my name is andrea zevedo and i'm currently as amar said the team manager for impact and partnerships at the soros economic development fund which is part of the open society foundations and i was before that global advisor for monitoring and evaluation and learning for oxfam great britain where i spent most of my time working on measuring unpaid care work so it's a team that is very close to my heart 
Uh, OSF has been working on the care economy for some years now, but until 2020, we have been acting on this field mainly through our grant making work at both global and national levels. And 2020 marks the point where we decided to develop our first investment strategy for the care economy in the context of our broader work on economic justice. So this strategy was organized around the ILO 5R that Amar mentioned at the beginning of this conversation. And it was imagined to operate in complementarity with our grant making work, again, both at global and national levels through the national foundations uh, that are part of OSF. Uh, it is fair to say that our investment strategy priorities are centered around redistribution and reduction of unpaid care work in society, and also on adequate rewarding of care workers. But we see, of course, a very direct connection with elements of recognition of the value of care work in everything that we do, as well as with representation of care workers and carers, which is something we try to ingrain in any intervention uh, we plan. Uh, as I said, this is a relatively new strategy, which we started in 2020, and also during a period of substantial transformation internally at OSF. And so far, the only asset under management we have under our care portfolio, which is a very good example to highlight some of the points Amar mentioned around impact, around what, what else is there uh, beyond, uh, beyond the, the direct impact that we have, uh, is in Colombia in a company called Simplifica, an investment we uh, did in 2021. And Colombia has an estimate of about 700,000 domestic workers, and very few of those workers have formal contracts with their employers. Uh, it is also, uh, Colombia also has a notoriously cumbersome social security system that makes it quite difficult for employers to formalize their domestic workers. And Simplifica offers a web-based solution for these employers, not only to formalize their workers, but also to manage everything in relation to these work relationships. So they can make their payments, they can give access to written contracts to these domestic workers, they can manage pay leave, and they can manage also maternity leave, and of course, the payments to social security. So the direct impact to workers is very uh, clear and very uh, and very obvious. But the most interesting thing about Simplifica from an impact perspective is that the company engages not only with employers and not only by giving access to formalization to these workers, but it also engages direct, directly with workers. One of the things that our investments together, investment together with other co-investors enabled was exactly the development of a platform targeting domestic workers that are uh, formalized through Simplifica. So through this platform, they can have access to information about their rights. They can access discounts and vouchers for different services for them and also for their families as well as having a direct line for questions about rights, uh, which also includes issues around harassment in the workplace and gender-based violence that Simplifica then refers to the official governmental services as needed. So Simplifica is also, it's not only working with the workers, but it's also very active in the policy debates around care work in Colombia. And it provides one of the few opportunities to engage employers' voice to the discussion. And this is something that is very important because if you look at ILO, it all it, it, like the discussions around ILO, they also they always ask for you to have the representation of workers, of employers, and of government. So in the case of domestic work, it's very difficult to have the voice of the employers because those are individual, those are individual contracts. So Simplica, Simplifica is providing a, a, an avenue for us to engage with this very important part of the equation that are employers. So you can see that Simplifica is an example that of what is possible 
in terms of revenue generation and business growth with business that provide services and products that address directly the inequalities in relation to unpaid and paid uh, care work. But there is so much more that this company is doing and that any company can do in any area to create value by addressing issues related to unpaid care work. And any company in any field can have their own care responsive strategy that speaks to their reality and to the context where they are to understand how they can create impact in relation to unpaid, uh, to unpaid care work. And a very common example of that is the adoption of flexible work arrangements that can enable employers uh, to manage their unpaid, re uh, unpaid responsibilities better or providing better access to childcare. All these measures uh, that recognize the value of unpaid care work in our work life can influence issues such as talent retention and employee satisfaction, for example. And also, impact-focused businesses can have a big role to play, as Simplifica uh, has, in advocating with other companies, advocating within their supply chains, their industries, and with governments when it comes to care policies. Uh, there are many different dimensions uh, to the care economy that different business can explore, as I said, and that we need to measure, right, to understand their true impact, mostly on women and girls, but also to society as a whole. So we, we might have been very developed, very good tools to measure those more, the, those more direct impacts, but there is so much more uh, happening. And on measuring unpaid care specifically, I like to say that there's a lot out there uh, on what to measure and how to measure the impact of care responsive strategies. And just to close, I would like to mention two of, uh, of those resources that I find very interesting. The first one is the Care Responsiveness Barometer which is a framework that was produced by Oxfam Great Britain in 2021 to plan, measure, and improve the care responsiveness of policies, investments, and institutions, and the work being developed by the International Association of Feminist Economists to push measurement in this area beyond measuring only time use, which is a very traditional care metric, to look at issues such as care work impact on health, access to opportunity, and, 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 and influences on policies. So I will share the link for those resources uh, here and very, very eager to, to, hear, to continue this, to hear your questions and continue this discussion. Yeah, thanks a lot for that, Andrea. And, and it's good to hear about, you know, how there is a direct impact and there is an indirect impact and how the indirect impact needs to be appropriately captured. Uh, there are tools. Um, but I mean, I'm, I'm sure they are not getting used as much as as the makers of those tools intended them to be. Um, so, so there is, I guess, there is some work for 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 the ecosystem to do there. Um, but but coming to uh, coming to Amy, uh, I think we would love to hear from from you about the Fair Employment Foundation and the work that uh, you are doing for for care workers in in Southeast Asia and Philippines in particular. Good afternoon. Thank you, Amar. Um, I'd like to start off with a couple of questions. Um, how many of you had to pay an illegal fee to get a job? How many of you needed to get a loan at usurious interest rates to cover those illegal fees? How many of you have knowingly been placed in a job by a recruiter with the expectation that you would fail? These are the realities of the recruitment space in migrant low-skilled work especially in the area where we have historically focused on, and that is domestic work. Um, we believe that forced labor, which exists because of broken markets, is a solvable world problem. Our goal is to fix the system by first identifying critical pain points, such as illegal fees and incentives for workers to fail in jobs. Then second is to establish businesses, such as an ethical employment agency, which we did in Hong Kong, and a training center in the Philippines to demonstrate how the system can be changed. 
Our theory of change is we seek to be the best. And if we were the best, we would become the biggest. And if we became the biggest, we could influence the broader system. For example, the Fair Employment Agency was established in 2014, charging no fees to work. We believe employers should pay the cost of recruiting workers, which is what you and I would expect. There are around 385,000 domestic workers in Hong Kong, a majority of whom are Filipinos and Indonesians. Our workers paid zero fees. We actually vet them. Um, employers and uh, workers are vetted so that they are matched properly. And over eight years, we placed 6,800 domestic workers and we have saved them an estimated $8.8 .8 million. We also have a 95% satisfaction rate from our employers. We are the fifth largest player in the market, meeting needs of all employers and not only a niche player. Agency fees paid by employers now reflect full cost to hire. In 2013, employers were only paying $500 to hire a worker. When we came into the market in 2014, we charged $1,000 and our competitors followed. This increase led to higher retention rates. So by 2016, there was a 24% increase in retention rates. Illegal fees to workers have, off, have also gone down. Workers used to pay $2,000 to get a job, but now uh, it's down to $700. But of course, we, we would still want that to go to be zero, right? Another example I'd like to give is the Fair Training Center, which was established in 2016. We developed and offered for free a country-specific domestic work soft and hard skills training program. Historically, training in the Philippines was only um, uh, hard skills training. The soft skills training was not given that much relevance. We are considered by the ILO Philippines as the gold standard in domestic work pre-migration training. In 2016, anecdotal evidence shows that 30 to 40% of first-timers are terminated in the first three months of employment. Our termination rates are below 15%. We are considered an industry expert by the Philippine government. Last year, we helped them review the existing training regulations and develop a hybrid model with the government. This new training model will now be used in the entire Philippines by next year. We also saw that our online soft skills training for domestic work was highly effective and developed one for seafarers, another large migrant sector. At the height of the pandemic, we were able to train 600 plus seafarers. We are now looking at developing soft skills modules for other industries as well. We have other initiatives, an employer pledge that seeks to change the migration narrative. We have 23 companies who have pledged with us to, do, um, to teach ethical hiring to their employee, employees. And we have around uh, 2,500 um, employees who we've already given workshops to. Um, we also uh, have an investment fund that will provide in-depth advisory support to ethical agencies. We believe this is the best way to activate a movement towards ethical recruitment globally. All our initiatives work individually and together to solve the issue of forced labor. So this is what we do in a nutshell, and I look forward to sharing more of our initiatives throughout this talk. Thank you. Sure. Thanks. Thanks a lot for that, Amy. It's, it's great to hear, you know, the wide range of activities from training to legal support uh, to influencing policy. Uh, and that's that's something more of that is needed, I would say. Um, but coming to coming to Subalakshmi, uh, I think we would love to hear from you about BMGF's perspectives on the care economy and maybe what all needs to come together to ensure that successful interventions are designed for the sector uh, and, and the ones like the Fair Employment Foundation can, can thrive. Yeah, uh, thanks so much, Amar, and uh, congratulations for actually picking this issue for this panel. I think it is very timely. I think it is 
absolutely urgent even. Um, of course, uh, at the Gates Foundation, we have started working a little bit more actively on care uh, in light of the pandemic, realizing that, you know, it's an issue that we cannot uh, not address. Uh, we have a small portfolio, which is looking at the whole question of care, but it is a significant um, area for us uh, when it comes to research and policy advocacy work. Um, I think, as Andrea was saying, uh, I think it's, it's really promising that um, uh, when the sustainable development goals were framed, uh, that uh, addressing unpaid care work became a stated goal and targets were defined around it. I think that was a big milestone for us in 2015. And of course, the ILO's updated framework, which talks not only of recognition, reduction and redistribution, but also rewarding and ensuring representation of care workers has really taken the discourse ahead many generations. So really thrilled that, you know, 40, 50 years of feminist activism has resulted in this, uh, where we stand today and have the opportunity. The other interesting uh, thing that I wanted to share is for us in the last two years, the Gates Foundation has been um, working very closely with a bunch of stakeholders as part of an action coalition on economic justice and rights. And this was part of the Generation Equality Forum that was being led by UN Women to commemorate the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action. Now for decades, the, uh, the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action has been sort of, you know, the, the North Star, the sort of goalpost when it comes to gender equality and how can we ensure it. But I think what was interesting about our journey in the last two years is that we saw for the first time it was not just women's rights organizations or early childhood care development organizations. We saw government stepping up. We saw philanthropy stepping up. We saw the private sector really getting into this whole discussion on what we can do to address unpaid care work in a big way. And to me, that is a really big shift from, you know, uh, let's say the last 15, 20 years of my professional life. I think I have never seen this kind of momentum. And therefore, I think it's really important that in a platform like Sankalp, where, you know, uh, 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 where our audiences, uh, you know, uh, comprise of the private sector, of the investor community, I think it's really important for us to find this common language and a shared goal uh, around how we can make a uh, this work for women and girls, and it's 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 just really really inspiring to hear Amy and others, you know, and the, and to read some of the documentation on your website about the kinds of uh, examples, the kinds of good practices that we can learn for from. Because I think that's really the learning where, where we can replicate and upscale and take forward. Uh, some of these ideas, um, and and but but I think there are a few missing elements which I'll also come to in a little bit that I think we could strengthen a little bit as we move forward. But I I do want to say that I want to congratulate the documentation and the work and also the conceptualization of unpaid care work in the way that you have in this project, because it covers something very dear to my heart, the realities of women living in Asia and Africa. And you are not looking just at care, but you are also looking at basic infrastructure like water, like you know, um, uh, energy. I think these are really uh, critical elements uh, which are linked to women's unpaid care work. And we often talk about the pandemic and its impact on women's unpaid care work. But I think equally we have a climate crisis and that has its own impact on women's unpaid care work that we don't know enough about maybe. And, and so I think there are a bunch of um, areas uh, 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 you know, when it comes to understanding of unpaid care that I think uh, reflect quite a lot in the ways that you have uh, uh, undertaken the research. And I think it's very important for the sector to continue to build on that because, uh, because like I said, it reflects the realities of women in the global South. And that has to be at the heart of any, um, any sort of conceptualization, any mobilization, any action. Um, I also wanted to say that, um, that I think, uh, like I said, uh, we are learning as an organization and me also as an individual about really how can gender lens investing and how can uh, uh, 
you know, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, the, the private sector play a much more proactive role in this space. So I also feel like this is a great learning platform for many of us who have worked on unpaid care for a long time, but maybe have not spoken to uh, diverse audiences or have not understood the realities of different uh, stakeholders. And I think that's a very important uh, bridge that we need to cross. Um, I wish there were more platforms. I'll come now a little bit to what I wish there was more of. So one is I wish there were more platforms like this. I wish there were more networks where we could share our good practice. I think it's great that you have the knowledge hub already set up, but can we create a community of practice around that where a lot more sharing and cross learning and exchange can happen. So that is really one point I wanted to bring up is that is, is something that I, I wish we had more of. Um, Second on my wish list is very similar to what Andrea was saying. Can we measure what the impact is? Can we see what the outcomes are really on the lives of women and girls? Because I think we tend to look more from how are we measuring impact? What are the metrics? Uh, based on which we are measuring impact? Um, there are several tools available. There are several frameworks available. I'm not sure that we have tested them enough in the context of private businesses for care. So can we try and do a bit more of that? That would be my second point uh, to, uh, to this uh, sort of uh, panel. The third point I'd like to say is, and how do we think of really scaling and replication but also institutionalization. And there again, I'll come back to where I started because I said there are different stakeholders who have a different role to play in this. We have the researchers in academia. We have the women's rights organizations on the ground. We have the multilaterals and the UN and you know they play their own role. We have the philanthropies and donors and the private sector. Each one of us plays our own role in this ecosystem. But how can we look at institutionalizing some of these learnings? How do we create long-term policy change? How do we ensure continued resources flow to these agendas? I think those are things that I would love for us to engage more on and discuss because I think those continue to be gaps uh, in, this, uh, in this space. Uh, so instead of being sort of really brilliant pockets of innovation and impact, uh, say in Nairobi or in Kigali or in Delhi or Bombay, how can we really make this a little bit more of a larger movement? And you know what is required for us to come together uh, in order to do that? Uh, so so that that would be my um, other uh, point. And finally, I also think um, at some level, when I talk of institutionalization, I'd also like to talk a little bit more broadly about the gender equality sector and where the resources are flowing and who they are flowing to and who's benefiting from these care businesses. So I think it's just a little bit more because I have heard challenges in many networks when I've spoken to either the sort of private investors in care uh, or I've heard about these businesses about how say, you know, like informal economy workers, we can't touch them. They're completely marginalized. They're completely unorganized. How can we create uh, uh, care businesses and uh, I live in India and I have seen the work of Seva in India and they do fantastic work, the Self-Employed Women's Association around building cooperatives for childcare. Can we learn more from those models which are really reaching the most marginalized? Um, uh, so I think these are some of the open questions for us to continue to learn from each other and build on and really uh, make sure that there is longer term impact. Because as you said, Amar, it is time for transformation. It's a now or never moment. Uh, in my entire career, this is the first time I have seen so many people come together on the care agenda. And I feel like we all have a role to play in ensuring that we uh, maintain the momentum and see tangible uh, change in the lives of women and girls. Uh, thanks a lot for that, Subhulakshmi. And I think you have touched upon multiple very important things, and not the least of which is, you know, the role of the various actors who are coming together for this topic now. And, you know, like they say, it, it takes a village, right? And when it comes to enterprises, it, it takes an ecosystem, uh, a word that we use quite often, uh, but but rightly so, right? And and you, you, you rightly mentioned about, uh, you've been talking about care businesses in terms of, uh, from the perspective of caregivers, 
but there might be businesses that are having this indirect impact uh, which which also goes a long way in mitigating some of some of the effects of climate change even businesses in 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 water in in energy and things like that so so with that uh, you know i would like uh, to show a video uh, of of such a business uh, from from bangladesh and and we can take this conversation further after that so i'd, I'll just request tanvi to play the video खबर पानी जोड़ी कर दूर थे दरजा कल आनी आनतार कर तो पानी व्यवहार कर लो कष्ट तो खूब आयरन छो फुटाइते हो Yeah, thanks a lot for that, Tanvi. And I think I think it's quite obvious from from the from the video that there is so much potential to foreground 
the care impact of such businesses there is impact not just on time savings resource savings uh, but also the health outcomes uh, so which which brings me back to you andrea i think uh, it would be good to you know hear your reflections on what we have heard so far and maybe share your thoughts on how such businesses can can best track and report their impact yes thank you amar i think it's it, it's great from the video you see what we're talking about in terms of uh impact that goes way beyond just the access to to clean water right and the uh, and the results in terms of health outcomes and there are so many other things that you could look at such as how much like going to a more traditional measurement like how much time these women is uh is saving women and girls are saving there is an issue of safety as well because going to fetch water is not necessarily a a, a safe uh activity uh there is direct there are direct impacts in 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 women's own uh health in terms of their bodily integrity of being hurt because you go fetch water and uh in in many other metrics but one point that i would like to make about the video is how uh, how important it is uh, uh to measure uh the impact of uh of these care responsive businesses on women and girls but how that it's not necessarily enough because paid and unpaid care work are what keep us going as a society so for the balance of how unpaid care work is distributed to change for women and girls it needs to change for everybody else so men private sector government like these sort of interventions has an impact in this whole ecosystem as we like to say and it's important to measure that as well because to to going back to our r we distribution only happens if it goes from women to men or to women to government to women to the private sector so it is a finite time is a finite resource it's 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 very uh, it's it is something that you can measure that there are only 24 hours in the day and you can distribute that among many other actors and care work is a societal issue so it affects many more people than just women and men and for you to understand those changes you need to look at men as well and you need to look at the other actors that are involved in these processes got it got it yeah thanks a lot for that andrea uh, coming to you amy um, you have you've been as part of the fair employment foundation you know tracking the impact that you have had on on the care workers for for some time now so please walk us through you know how you came about doing it was it something that you started at some point after the foundation started working or was it, or is it something that was baked into it right from right from the get go um we really uh, tried to measure impact right from the get go so um for the agency um they were really tracking um like how many workers actually went through their doors and how much uh, monies were saved from them not having to pay those illegal fees for the training center we really based um our impact on termination rates can you imagine 30 to 40% of first timers will be terminated in the first three months of their employment so we brought that down actually um less than i say i'm very conservative at less than 15% but it's actually at around 5 6% um so a lot of workers are staying in their jobs and able to really you know they they leave their countries to really um work for the dreams and the goals of their families they're able to do this at a much quicker time um the interventions we do at the training center is we actually teach them financial education there or financial planning so they're able to set up their budgets they know how long they need to stay to reach their goals and so they try to keep themselves on track with that So since we only started in 2016 based on our data because we do um track them for the first two years of their employment some we even track up to now so we're going to get data now um and see if they are on track in their um in the in trying to pursue their dreams a lot of them have allotted 6 years to be able to uh, attain the education uh, a home 
um, and maybe some money for a small business. So we will be tracking that by next year. So these are things that we really are very serious about. There's a lot of data that we have and we're starting to mine them because we're, we were, were relatively new. And so um, uh, and we're just so excited on what else we will discover along the way. Got it, got it. Thanks, thanks a lot for that, Amy. Um, so Andrea, I would love to hear from you about, you know, how the journey from going from a foundation to an investment strategy uh, has has been uh, and any learnings in, in, in that journey thus far. Uh, thank you, Amar, for this question. Uh, I think this this was this was a very pleasant journey so far, I can say, uh, at least for me, that I is, I'm very fond of this topic. Uh, but I think we were very welcomed by our peers in the Open Society Foundations. We work the the nature of uh, STDF is to work very closely with our grant makers. And our grant makers, they lead the, 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 the impact thinking on the work. So we have the general approach for the strategy, but what we're looking for is decided and is agreed with our na national and global partners in the foundation. And we were received very uh, we, uh, with a lot of openness by, by our peers and by initiatives such as the one as the mapping and partners uh, such as IDRC uh, in developing this strategy and pushing forward this strategy. So it has been very interesting to work with the different regions where we work to try to unpack what are the main problems. So for example, for Latin America, it is very obvious. It is the most direct thing that we observe the issue of domestic workers and formalization of domestic workers because of the regional debate, because of the regional priorities. But uh, it will change depending on the region. Like Africa, we, we are still exploring uh, pipeline ideas, but it will likely have more connection with access to water, access to services, and, and in all those aspects, we are trying to bring in the lenses of uh, economic justice. We're trying to bring in the lenses of climate justice. So it has been really interesting from a strategic perspective to think this work in partnership with our peers within the foundation, but also the organizations, the uh, the CSOs, the non-governmental organizations that they bring to the conversation. So we are bring we are building these networks from a private sector perspective, but we're also trying as much as possible to take this comparative advantage of OSF, that is having the impact uh, investing arm and the grant making arm to work together as much as possible. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Thanks for that, Andrea. I, I have, uh, you know, one more question for you, but uh, I'll just go to Subalakshmi. I know she has dropped off, but Subalakshmi, if you can, if you can hear me, um, I'm curious to hear your perception about, about, you know, this, this bringing in of the private sector and investments uh, to the care sector. Is there anything that from your experience, you would, you would caution uh, those, those who are chasing this or, or rather flag as aspects that that they should be mindful of. Yeah, no, thanks so much, Amar. And sorry, I had to, uh, I had a power cut here, so still trying to connect back. But um, uh, I can, uh, so just to share a few reflections, I think it's not easy sometimes uh, for, uh, for different stakeholders to work on one agenda. Why? Because there are different uh, uh, sort of, uh, is being perceived uh, and yet each one has a critical role to play we know that um, in sort of solving the problem so when i'm saying that you know some of the important things the private can do is what i already mentioned is drive the innovation uh, build on what works uh, Try and create the community of practice, as I mentioned, you know, which I think is missing. Help convene stakeholders. I think there is a certain authority and convening power that the private sector can bring to this whole discourse by convening um, um, uh, uh, different people. I think 
even the the question of uh, measurement, institutionalization, etc., which I raised as I think current gaps. I think there the private sector's role could be uh, more facilitative. Uh, you know, building on uh, as Andrea was mentioning the work of feminist economists, building on uh, uh, work that Amy and others are doing on ground. So both from the research and practitioners angle, what the private sector can perhaps do is uh, is 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 uh, is actually resource and support those initiatives. Uh, so I think there will be some ways in which the private sector can play a leadership role, uh, some in which it can play a convening and more facilitator role, and uh, definitely a champion and a voice and influence role. I think that goes without saying um, that these are the ways in which I think the the private sector can um, lead, demonstrate, facilitate uh, the whole conversation around care and support. I think that is the one thing I wanted to add is that support communities of practice that already exist or, uh, you know, that may be created around care. Uh, yeah, because I think that, that like I said, is, is something that is missing. Amar, may I share something? Yes, please come in, Amy. Yeah, just to add to um, what was previously mentioned. Um, well, we at Fair Trade Union said we are the we are in the private sector. So when we talk about engaging government, I mentioned a while ago on how we really tried to engage government so that they would try to revise the training regulations in such a way that it is more current, more relevant, and more useful for workers. And we did that through impact measurement. We showed them what we were doing and how successful we were in terms of having low termination rates. So when we did that, they listened to us and partnered together with the ILO. So it was a multi-sectoral um, uh, project. So we were able to change the training regulations. And for our um, uh, investment um, um, uh, uh, organization, what we did is we know that we have a very good uh, business model in the Fair Employment Agency. So we wanted to look for other ethical agencies in other countries. And we found them. We found one in Malaysia called Pink Collar and another one in Singapore called um, Jobs and Staff. And we've put in some small investment there so that we can share best practices, share our processes. So we're there. So we're trying slowly to you know, um, uh, share what we do. And I think you are, everyone here is correct. That's how this is going to change the care economy. Um, yeah, and I just wanted to add two quick points uh, to, to what Amy Isubalakshmi had uh, mentioned already, uh, that we need to, to build these communities, the, the share learning and build practice together, acknowledging that a lot has been done already. The, the private sector is not coming to this uh, new. It's like a lot has been done by the development sector. There's a lot to, do, to be done in terms of measurement and learning, but also framing the issue and learning with what was tested and practiced before. And I think there is a role in something that is a hot topic now in impact investing, that is ESG. And there, there could be a very clear connection between care policies and institutionalization of some care issues through ESG. And I think there is a lot of space for us to push on that because if we're talking about how if ESG relates to how company operates and their intent for impact through how they operate, care is a key issue that should be more visible throughout different ESG policies when we talk about social impact of how business operate. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to make this point. Got it, got it. Thanks a lot for that, Amy and Andrea. Uh, Amy, I, I wanted to stay with you a little bit. Um, I think we heard about, we've been talking about the private sector, a whole lot of things, right? Uh, I think Subalakshmi mentioned the role of support providers. Um, spoke from, from a capital provider point of view. So just would like to hear from you, what has your experience been in engaging with these two you know, types of types of entities in the private sector, uh, support that you would have received and, and your experience with accessing capital, which I'm sure uh, would help you to scale up. 
Um, uh, we've been um, very first, of, co of course, of the impact measurement that we do. That's very important to our funders. Um, we're also very transparent in what we do. We, we also admit if we make mistakes and how we try to pivot and correct those mistakes if we do them. Um, um, we try our best to be as innovative as we can, especially like during the pandemic. There was no training because we couldn't go, uh, uh, the workers couldn't go to the training center. So we immediately thought of doing it online. Immediately in two months, we crafted something, worked with the government, have them approve it, and we were able to start training again. So it's a continuous process of innovation for us. And when funders see um, how fast we try to adapt to the changes in the world, um, I think maybe that makes them um, uh, uh, that makes us a little bit more attractive. But of course, there's still so much work to be done. Um, we, we're just at the tip of the iceberg. Um, of course, um, we look towards uh, being funded more by, uh, by uh, foundations or other um, investors. Because we, as I mentioned a while ago, we're also going to other countries and trying to do some investing in ethical um, agencies and teaching them how to do it in their own countries and in a localized way. Because it's different if we go there. We don't really know the landscape of that country. So it's much better that it's um, um, a, a local uh, uh, ethical agency that we help. Got it. Got it. Thanks a lot for that. Um, Andrea, I've been... I've been... You know, thinking about this one thing that you mentioned earlier uh, in, in your opening statement, how how the impact is often very, very, you know, decentralized. So when it when it comes for uh, from the point of view of a Simplifica or a Fair Employment Foundation where they're working with the care workers, it, it might be relatively easier to measure the impact on the lives of the workers themselves as against the customers, right, who tend to be more decentralized. Um, so any thoughts on, on measurement on that front um, and how can that impact be, be really captured? I think we saw it in, in, in the case of polio water as well. How, how, how does a company, you know, really go to its customers and, and capture the impact when it's probably not, not very easy to do and costly as well? Yeah, uh, that's a great question, Omar. And uh, using again the example for Simplifica, and like I'll, I'll try to connect the, the example, but also like some practical issues when you are managing uh, a portfolio and when you have to do that from the from a more, from a more institutional perspective. That's when the investment on evaluation uh, comes in, because you're not gonna. You're not going to do this all the time for all the companies that you have in your portfolio, for example. So in, in the case of Simplifica, for example, we had uh, one of the co-investors uh, in Simplifica uh, is uh, uh, Alive, who brings in the lean data uh, methodology to collect additional data uh, for uh, for the company, and we are working very closely with Alive to try to influence their lean data uh, data collection process. And in this process, because they had this additional resource from their investor to measure that, and that speaks to the commitment of the private sector agency who is engaging with the company, we were able to collect data both from the uh, domestic workers, but also from the employers on what has been the benefits for them in having a domestic worker that is formalized. And we try to bring in metrics around what, they, what, they, what their relationship with domestic work, what changed in their relationship with domestic work, but also what changed in their perceptions about formalization of domestic workers, because for us, this was a very important learning question that we had as well with these investment to replicate and to gain scale in, in the country. So it was only possible for us to measure it. And I think Simplifica will, uh, uh, will release a public report with some of these data soon for those who are interested. Uh, uh, it, we were only able to measure that because there was a commitment from the uh, investor 
in collecting these additional data, acknowledging that there are some things that we can do from a measurement perspective that will provide us more uh, top level data. But if we really want to understand this, we need to make sure that we are making this commitment as well to collect that data to go a bit uh, a bit further. So like in the case of Simplifica, we looked at, uh, we added some questions around time use for uh, for employers, employer satisfactions with the service, as I said, uh, level of understanding about the rights of domestic workers. And, and yeah, and, and this should, should, should be out. I'm not entirely sure, but if it's public, I, I will share as well. Sure, thanks a lot for that, Andrea. And I think I think Simplifica also featured in in our research, as did Fair Employment Foundation, Folia Water, of course. And I saw a couple of uh, you know names that I know in 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 the audience as well. I think Strong Start is here, uh, which is also part of the of the mapping on the Care Economy Knowledge Hub. Um, so many of these businesses are also uh, operating booths, uh, virtual booths at Sankalp. So I would request everybody in the audience to you know visit those booths to learn a little bit more about about these businesses and the impact that they're having. And of course, visit the Care Economy Knowledge Hub itself. It's it's still under construction, um, but uh, in about six months' time, it should have a have a wealth of information uh, about uh, about the various businesses that that we are coming across. So we have only about a couple of minutes to go. Uh, I am checking if there are any questions, but irrespective, I think uh, uh, Subalakshmi, I think it will be great if we could hear some reflections to close the session from you. Uh, no, thanks, Amar. Like I said, it's really important that we continue to learn from these experiences. And uh, I really uh, wanted to encourage you to continue to build the uh, knowledge hub as a community of practice. I think that would be really, really critical. And uh, as others have said, I think there are existing spaces where some of this learning and sharing can be plugged in uh, with the care sector including care workers, organizations, governments, multilaterals. One of them is the Global Alliance for Care. Uh, we are also a member of it as Gates Foundation, and it is also one of the uh, very interesting uh, outcomes from the Generation Equality Forum. It came as a collective of, I think, now 70 plus governments, donors, organizations that are part of it. So I feel like it would be really great if um, if there could be more exchange uh, and, and sort of cross learning across the platforms, um, especially around the learning of what works. Yeah, uh, because I think we are no longer in a world where we have to convince people why care is important. We are in a world now where we have to just sort of uh, experiment and uh, model and replicate how it is done. And so I think uh, it's an exciting time uh, in the care movement. And uh, I hope we can all stay in touch uh, and uh, bring each other's strengths to the table to, to advance the care agenda together. Yeah, thanks a lot for that, uh, Sulakshmi. And I would I would encourage everybody in the audience to use the BOVA app and reach out to people that you want to Want to connect with and all of us at IntelliCap, uh, of course, remain available uh, in case you want to reach out to us. Um, I think I think we are just in time. Uh, I think this was this was this was very useful, and I hope uh, everybody enjoyed it as much as as much as I did. Um, and I hope that together we are able to make make a difference uh, for for women and girls through impacting the care economy. So thank you again to all your all, all the panelists for, for your time and everybody in the audience. I hope you have a good day today and, and two more days at Sankal. Uh, there are a lot of interesting sessions happening. So please, please uh, make sure that you are aware of the agenda. And I, I look forward to seeing you at some of the other sessions. So thank you again for your time. And with this, I'll, I'll close this session. Thank you.